the department uh, basically does strategy and advise a policymaker about new technology. Uh, we also set up uh, teams for special projects, specific projects uh, for digital transformation and, and this is our, our, our job basically to bring technology into the government environment. Digital and, and the technology are going to be part of the core business of demonstration. It's not anymore something you need, it's not a tool, it's not anymore just a cost. What really excites me is not just the technology, because the technology itself doesn't say anything, but how are we managed to use that kind of technology? Usually technology is not neutral. You cannot use technology. You need some principle, and, and uh, this principle usually have to drive you. This is Siana TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Paolo De Rosa, who is the Chief Technology Officer of the National Department of Digital Transformation in Italy. A very warm welcome, Paolo. Hi, Andrik. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, thank you. Paolo, you have a degree in telecommunications from the University of Pisa. You started your career in 2002 as a system and as a network administrator. You spent your career in different engineering roles in several different organizations, among them European institutions and the University of Pisa. Uh, you worked in Germany for Canonical uh, Limited and for Deutsche Telekom. And you came back to Italy and joined the uh, National Department of Digital Transformation in 2017, uh, where you were promoted CTO in 2019 and served um, two different uh, governments so far. So, Paolo, tell us a little bit more about you. Who are you really? What's your background? And how did you uh, come into this role as CTO? Yeah. So, yes, yeah, a very, very good brief. Uh, I started, as you said, uh, working in many different engineering roles. Uh, my background is technical, so I used to work very deep in technology and at the beginning of my career, then I moved uh, here in the uh, digital transformation department. Well, at the beginning, it, was, it wasn't really a department. It was a... Um, uh, was part of a team, a digital team, a uh, digital transformation team uh, led by Diego Piacentini, and that's it's where I started my journey here in the public administration uh, in the government. And uh, I started as an expert in cloud because uh, all my previous mm -hmm. jobs were related to how to build cloud, uh, mainly with open source technology. And it, this is what I did with Canonical and, and Deutsche Telekom um, as cloud engineer there. And I started here because uh, a digital transformation team needed someone that could lead um, the uh, digital transformation and uh, define a strategy for cloud for the whole public administration. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about what the team exactly does. It's, it's, it's defining strategy for cloud. It's, and, and what else is, it, is going on in the team? Yeah, so uh, starting from that time up to now, a lot of things has changed. So there were there have been four different governments, and and, and now we are a very structured team. We are around three hundred people, more or less. Um, uh, the department uh, basically uh, does strategy, uh, and especially in my role, uh, um, strategy and advise a policymaker about new technology. Uh, we also set up. Uh, teams for special projects, specific projects uh, for digital transformation. And, and this is our, our, our job, basically, to bring technology into the government environment uh, and, and bring, bring all the, 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 the support needed to understand technology and use technology at the government level. Okay. Let's talk about that, because, I mean, that's a very important role. I can imagine a lot needs to change in government organizations around the world. Yeah. Italy will not be an exception. So I know that um, the, let's say, the national cloud strategy has been one of the major programs that you and, and, and your teams have been working on. Tell us a little bit the background of, of, of that program. What was, the, what was the, the issue? What was the problem? And how did you uh, address it? Yeah, so let's start a little bit from understanding what exactly means working here, because uh, 
Um, we work with, uh, well, in Italy, we have around to 22,000 of public administration, from municipalities up to the central agency. There are a lot of uh, autonomous administration that should follow um, a strategy to, uh, for their digital transformation. Yeah, so that's also including hosp hospitals and schools exactly. and, and, exactly. and so on and so on. Yeah. Municipalities, schools, everything as is public, normally as an IT department. Right. So and, and, and in the past, this was basically managed by their self. So there wasn't a strategy. There wasn't uh, someone telling them uh, how to deal with digital, uh, how to deal with this technology. Uh, the public administration basically were mm, very, very sometimes um, uh, using different different kind of technology advised by local partners. And there wasn't a, a real one big picture for all of them. So what we did is yep. exactly this, understand where we were at that time and where, how we could help them to drive this uh, big and huge transformation was uh, uh, hitting everybody. Um, so uh, especially for cloud, uh, they had a lot of uh, on-premise hardware, on-premise data center uh, managed by themselves. So uh, you can imagine that there was a lot of diversity uh, related to the, the sites of the public administration you were dealing with. So, because in the municipality we have a town of 5,000 citizens, up to 5,000 people, up to a uh, million of people like Rome. So, you can understand the budget and, and, and the services are very different, the sites are very different, also in the school or the central administration. So, um, each of them basically have to, uh, still now uh, their own data center. So the, the, the need was uh, because of drive of because of the cost of this. It's huge if you think that everybody is buying uh, hardware for doing the same thing. Uh, uh, it's very uh, impressive. Yep. Um, what, so what we did is trying to find a way to let them to the cloud in order to. Uh, dismiss their hardware and just move their business function into, well, <laughs> not exactly business, but public functions, public services into the cloud. This has huge benefit from, uh, from cost perspective, from security perspective, from scalability perspective, and so on. They don't need any more to focus or, or to spend energy and, and, and money around uh, infrastructure that should be a commodity today but just on their uh, goal, on their mission. Let's provide digital services, public service to, uh, to the citizen. So that was so, the challenge. More than 22,000 organizations across Italy, schools, hospitals, regional administration, municipalities and so on, all managing their own data centers, infrastructure, everything, everybody doing their own best, but not the national uh, well, infrastructure or strategy around that. So that's the situation that you started from. Exactly, and uh, as you can imagine, also they are basically. Uh, I mean, it's not easy to give them some instruction, so it's not easy to uh, <laughs> to address what they want to do. It's like having a huge company with twenty-two thousand of departments basically moving on their own. So uh, what we did is, first of all, define a strategy, define a strategy um, also for classification of the data and, and the services, because they manage different kind of data and different kind of services. Uh, so we define um, classification. And also, we, um, in the strategy, we also define it, um, the qualification process, because moving from their own on-premise uh, hardware, on-premise data center up into the cloud, we needed some minimum requirements in terms of availability, security, and so on. So moving, leaving a, 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 a secure place up to another one, you need to be sure that uh, the new one has the right requirements. So um, mm -hmm. classification of data, qualification of the, of the cloud services. And then also in the strategy, we added a, a third pillar that was um, having um, special cloud uh, for national agency that have a uh, specific requirement for security and national security uh, from national security perspective because 
there are such kind of data, a specific type of data, it's um, uh, required a very high level of uh, uh, security standards and also um, uh, um, uh, an approach to digital sovereignty where basically the, the, um, the data cannot be accessed by, by uh, other, other companies. So this, these three components, basically, these three pillars of the strategy uh, is it's the first step we did. So clarify mm -hmm. what was the situation, what was the challenge, then try to def identify three steps, three components that should be followed. So classific first of all, classify your data and understand what kind of requirements you need. Second one, uh, for the market, qualify your services. So we know where what kind of data you can manage. And third one, uh, if you have special strategic data, uh, very sensitive data, there is a special place where to, uh, where to go. Okay, and that special place is the National Strategic Hub, right? The right. NSH. So tell me a little bit about that. How far is that? And, and what's the, really the goal of, of that part? Yeah, so uh, this was where, uh, in, um, I think that um, the National Strategic Hub, uh, it's uh, our answer to the need to find a, a way to use um, the best uh, technology we have in cloud, so provided by cloud service provider, but also uh, try to decouple uh, this technology from the issue uh, we have seen with the Cloud Act or uh, the issue related to um, digital sovereignty, so access of, of data for uh, legal uh, uh, needs and legal requirements. And um, in order to decouple this, uh, the, the, the National Strategic App has been designed to have uh, um, an, an operator defined by the tender. So we did a tender and this tender is, is over. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, has been... Um, uh, I mean, we, we have already uh, a company that won the tender. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is not just, uh, I mean, it's going to be the operator for private cloud and public cloud with technology provided by the cloud service provider. So we are not going to use mm -hmm. only a private and industry standard solution that is also part of the, of the project but we are going also to uh, use cloud service providers, so, so the best of breed we have in technology uh, provided by the, the big company. But in this case, yep. all the hardware, all the infrastructure, everything is going to be managed by a national operator. Uh, so uh, the cloud app cannot, cannot, in theory, we try to, <laughs> to address this yep. issue, to mitigate the risk, to be honest. Um, uh, and that cannot be accessed. So you have the national operator, right? your, your strategic hub, and then you have the, the qualified uh, public providers, and then you have the process to allocate who, who, which of, uh, who needs to use what for what type of applications and data. Right. Is that uh, the right summary? Correct, and we have also, also another uh, tool that's very important. With the National uh, Resilience and Recovery Plan, we got around mm -hmm. two billion of uh, funds to support the administration to move for the process. So what we are, we are um, distributing these funds to uh, uh, the different administration in order to support the, uh, the migration because they now have to migrate from, from their own on-prem data center into public cloud or in this uh, national strategic app that's going to provide two main different type of cloud as it's uh, private and public, but also uh, encrypted cloud. So very specific encrypted cloud to solve that issue. Yeah. So a huge plan, but also a huge budget yeah. to basically get 20,000, 20, more than 20,000 different entities move to the cloud, do that cloudification as, uh, as soon as possible. What are, what are the targets? When do you want to be where? What's, what's, the, what's the KPIs that you, uh, that you have for this program? Well, we have, first of all, we have the digital compass uh, that it's uh, um, our goals set by the European Commission uh, that provides around 70% uh, of, 75% of public service provided through digital infrastructure. And so uh, we are trying to um, 
go to this. And this is our, our basically our, our, our goal. So we are we 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 try we are trying to have seventy five percent of the public administration using the cloud and seventy five percent of the um, enterprises, so small and medium enterprises, to use the cloud. This is our goal. This is set also by uh, the um, uh, the digital compass from European Commission. Seventy five percent of administration needs to be using cloud services yes. in twenty twenty six. But that doesn't mean that 75% of, of their applications is already in the cloud, or it's, it's they, they've started using it. That's the goal, right? Yes, that, that's the goal. That's the goal. They, they should dismiss their own data center. No, I mean, mm -hmm. they, uh, when we, we consider that an administration is, more, uh, is in the cloud, when they um, have uh, dismissed the infrastructure. Okay, so your goal is that 75% of Italian public administration are fully cloud and have no more on-premise uh, data centers by themselves. So that's a very ambitious goal, right? By uh, 2026 in, uh, in, in, in uh, a small number of years. So um, big, big program. Yeah, the, the, it's ambitious, but um, I have to say also that um, we have many small administration in the country. So if you think mm -hmm. the municipality, uh, under the 5,000 of uh, people, the citizen are uh, half of the municipality. And in this case, they haven't so much infrastructure. So they, they just need to start using uh, the services. And we will have, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's ambitious, but it's ambitious because we also need to um, uh, stick close to the administration. And uh, in yeah. fact, we, uh, we also have a specific team dealing with the process, supporting the administration doing this. It's called Transformation Team and it's attached to, directly mm -hmm. to the department and uh, basically has a um, uh, specific team in each region of Italy. So we, we will have yeah. specific people dedicated to support the administration in this process. To how to get the money, how to, uh, to, uh, to do the migration plan and how uh, um, uh, move to the application into the cloud. In many cases, they are not even using digital. In some cases, they, they need, just need to start using services provided. And this is also interesting from the market side because we are, uh, uh, we are going to have a spike of uh, requests of, of, of demand in the market. So, and, and I think the challenge is also for the market. Is, is the market ready for this kind of uh, uh, huge yeah. requests coming? Uh, because it's, mm, it's a little bit the challenge. Yeah, so a, a huge investment, almost that 2 billion uh, euro that's gonna, gonna go in there. National provider of, of, of cloud services. Um, I mean, ambitious uh, targets of having 75% of, of administrations uh, in there by 2026. Do you have also an idea of the, of the returns, of the savings that it will generate? Uh, Money-wise, is there some uh, some figures that we can put on that as well mm. we tried we tried we are talking about the 30 percent of uh, savings of what we are spending mm -hmm. today but i mean it's very complicated doing this kind of uh, calculating because you can understand that we have the whole public administration spending here but uh, uh yes our our esti um, estimation is around 30 percent Okay, and what is exactly your you, your role and, and and the role of your teams in this in this whole uh, program? I mean, as the CTO of the uh, uh, Department for Digital Transformation, um, have you been defining the and and, and uh, the, the the specs for this? Tell me a little bit more about your uh, your role and and the role of your team in this huge program. So, what my team did uh, um, first of all is to understand the situation. So we spent a lot of time in the public administration to understand where we were and where we are, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a sort of um, analysis how to understand that. And then we, uh, with that information, with that data, we built the strategy. Uh, we talked uh, with the public administration, we talked with the market, uh, we talked with the operator, trying to understand what kind of services, uh, specific type, because we also, um, got the, um, a way to identify the name of the application and the services that we are going to move. And this was uh, done by um, a lot of uh, work on the field, trying asking the administration survey and, and, and so we did with this information, we did the strategy, we did the classification together with the, the uh, National Security Agency. 
cybersecurity agency. Uh, it's, it's, it's working together with us. Uh, and, uh, and then we define the tender and uh, the, the, all the requirements for the national strategic arm. So, and at the same time, we will drive the, trend, the tender so for, for all the time. Um, this, is, yeah. this has been our role up to now. Now we have a, a different team that is going to support the process of, of getting money, as I said before, there is a transformation team that is going to do this, this work. So my team led this uh, initial work. Also in the National Reco uh, uh, Resilience and Recovery Plan, we uh, wrote them basically the digital part. There. So how, how to move Italy into the, um, into the how, how to recover the gap fill the gap we have we uh, in and uh, yep. digital and i think this was uh, was very exciting to be honest and now seeing that it's happening it's even more exciting and what do you see as the biggest challenge for let's say for the next 12 months or so in in, in a huge program like this keep going so i think the the, the government has been able to uh the minister especially uh victoria colau has been able to uh, really move all the pieces of, uh, on the table and, and put everybody in line with milestone, target, and we are very, very, in some cases we are arriving early. That this is very visible from the um, digital economy and society index, DESI, where Italy is really recovering fast and fast um, the, uh, the gap we have. Uh, so, what um, what we need to do in the next 12 months is keep going, keep the pace, uh, and and just do what is already written in in the, uh, in, in the plan. So this is very important. Yeah, implementing a huge program like this is, is not a piece of cake. Eh? There's so many many people involved, so many stakeholders, and and, and so on, so many change yeah. that needs to happen. So. Uh... So that's going to be uh, very interesting. Let's look at another uh, program. Uh, and, and, and if I may, if, uh, if I may, uh, yeah, and, sure. Uh, something is very uh, specific of Italy. It's uh, when I say keep going. That uh, we have a, a very um, we are as a country we have an instability in terms of government. So we're not really stable. I think everybody knows in Europe, mm -hmm. and and that's that's the, the point. So um, the politics has and needs to understand that. This kind of uh, changes, um, deep change in the, in, in, in the society needs time. Uh, you need to keep going in the, in the same way for a while. If you start moving and changing stuff, uh, you will not, never get in the goal. You are, will never get in oh, the no. I mean, these are long-term programs and you cannot just change them every time exactly. there's a new minister. This, I mean, this needs to have long legs and, and, and needs to run out for many, many years. Uh, so, um, yeah, stability in the program, a uh, huge program like this is, is uh, of course, super important. Let's talk about uh, the, uh, an, another program that you've been uh, working on together uh, with your team in the last, uh, let's say, couple of years. And that's on the, the Green Pass, the, uh, the COVID certificate. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so tell me a little bit, what was the challenge? What was the issue? What was the problem? And, uh, and how did you help the country to, uh, to uh, attack that problem? Yeah, so Green Pass is a digital uh, COVID certificate. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. is, an, is an European initiative to um, let the people move in, in, in Europe to, to for, uh, guarantee the free movement in, in Europe during the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and this uh, in Italy has been used also in a different way. I mean, it's been extended to as a sort of nudging to uh, bring people to get vaccinated. Um, and uh, because we had some more restriction in respect of the European, at the European level, where it was needed just to travel, in Italy we got some restriction also to access some, some, some places. And um, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the challenge was to provide a digital uh, certificate to millions of people uh, in order, after they uh, uh, get vac vaccinated. And uh, this was uh, incredibly <laughs> um, fast, has been done very, very fast uh, in all the European countries and, uh, and then extended also uh, to other countries outside of Europe. 
So how do you start with something like that? So the challenge is, Paolo, go and uh, develop us a green pass or certificate so that people that are vaccinated, yeah. that they have like uh, a certificate, a digital certificate so that they can travel around Europe and, and please make this into Euro a European pass at the same time. Yeah. So uh, how do you approach uh, something like that? Yeah, usually the idea starts from the policymaker. So they, they have seen this mm -hmm. uh, opportunity uh, and then in Europe and then move to each country and say, OK, can we do something like that? And we were late, um, lucky because a uh, few months ago we started a similar project that was related to contra contact tracing app. So we made a con different contact tracing app, talked together in, in different countries. And so all the, all the, all the mm -hmm. work done there has been reused for the Green Pass, especially in terms of cooperation between different members. Uh, in uh, European agencies, uh, also in terms of technology, because sometimes has been have been used uh, the same app to distribute the uh, the COVID certificate. So uh, this has started uh, in in this context. So cooperating between different agency, uh, co cooperating between different ministry here, because uh, Ministry of Health was involved and was leading this uh, this project. Uh, at the same mm -hmm. time, also. Um, uh, the special commissioner we have for uh, the pandemic that was driving the vaccination uh, campaign. Uh, so uh, it was a very, very um, uh, interesting uh, work model because it was multi-stakeholder. We were, were bringing uh, the support for technologists on the technology side on how to build this, how to connect all the databases about the vaccination, for example, and generate this uh, certificate and, and then how to distribute uh, the certificate. Mm -hmm. At the same time, also adoption was uh, uh, designed to, uh, to be multi-channel, um, to, to, to reach all the population, because you need to deal with people that maybe are not able to, uh, to use digital uh, mm -hmm. uh, tools, digital devices. And, and so yep. it was very um, multidisciplinary approach and multi-stakeholder. And this was very possible thanks to also great people collaborating very well in, in, in the country. So from different ministries, I, I was saying before, and also between different member states, coordinated by the, the commission, obviously. Mm -hmm. So how did uh, and so how did this progress? How do what are the different steps that you implemented? Can you uh, take us a little bit through the history of that? Yes. So first of all, we define a common standard, and then we define uh, mm -hmm. uh, also we um, um, define a common tool. So the app, the uh, two different apps to be honest, one to distribute the uh, COVID certificate, uh, and the other one to verify the COVID certificate. And this was done uh, developing open source code. So the, 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 all the apps were uh, basically based on, on, on one made by the commission, one for everybody. So uh, then all the member states were, uh, were able to uh, customize specifically for uh, each country uh, the initial app done by the commission. Uh, so the standard was common. So the data format was common. So we have been able to define uh, all the data and metadata needed for uh, to understand what kind of vaccine, when was done, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the different policies could be uh, defined in different member states because you know, no, I mean, this is very uh, it's the first time that the Commission uh, or Europe is working on something like that because you know uh, the, the the health part, the coordination of the health part is not necessarily part of the. Uh, the goal of the commission. So, and, and this was very, um, it was interesting because we started from the technical side, was very, the group was very technical and focused on, 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 on get all the things done. And it was done basically in, in three months uh, from, from March to up to uh, June and in 2021. So in 2021, from March to June, you worked with, with, with your team on, on developing the standards yeah. and the protocols and, and, uh, and, and the apps and, uh, and so on. Yes. And so what was the end result then? Is that you could launch these, the, these apps and these certificates? Yes, we launched the app and the certificates. So we already had, uh, I don't remember that time, but we had millions of uh, people vaccinated already. So we could release mm -hmm. this uh, certificate 
at the right time, on time. Uh, so it was fir 1st of July. Uh, the, the application of um, the regulation was uh, started when we released the, the certificate uh, earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. And up to now, we have released 310 millions of certificates. Uh, mm -hmm. There are different types of certificates, obviously, if you are vaccinated, if you are, um, um, if you just got the COVID and, and you, are, you are recovered from COVID. Uh, um, yeah. uh, one, one of the biggest issues for us was to collect all the information because uh, health organization in Italy is uh, distributed from in 20 regions and each region has a, a mm -hmm. specific rules, specific databases. So the, 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 the hard part was to collect all the information, normalize the data and, and then uh, generate uh, the certificate. And obviously the, the distribution part uh, was relatively simple, <laughs> simple uh, in respect mm -hmm. of uh, the first one, because, uh, you know, timing when you got vaccine and you receive the, the certificate, you know, especially if you have to go, I don't know, if you have to fly or if you have to go to the school, you need a, the, the certificate. So we, have, we had to be very, very, uh, we, we had to pay a lot of attention um, to the timing. And, and, and all, the, all, the, all the stack that we, all the technology stack we put in place was basically, we reused what we had be used before for, uh, for Muni, for the contact tracing app. Mm -hmm. And so it was possible to, to get this in very, in, in, I mean, very short time. Okay, so tens of millions of people, what is it, 60, 70 million of people that are uh, that are using these uh, the, these apps and, and so hundreds of million different certificates of the different uh, vaccinations that have uh, uh, have been done in in Italy and that basically allowed the Italian population to to get Move. their freedom back to get part yeah. of the freedom back and uh, uh, so how does that what was the impact of this on on European level and and so how did you collaborate uh, with, uh, with, with other countries on this? We basically uh, have been working in, uh, in um, a cooperation network that's called eHealth Network, uh, together mm -hmm. with all the health ministries and uh, also digital transformation team of other countries. And this, this yep. uh, cooperation network is, uh, is, is um, led by, by the European Commission, so from DigiConnect. And that, that was the context where we were discussing, deciding in terms of policies, in terms of technology, in terms of protocols, mm -hmm. ever been, everything has been defined there. And uh, uh, yeah. the ministry, obviously, that was leading all this uh, was the Ministry of Health. We were just supporting, but our support was obviously on, yeah. on, on, on the technology side. Then we also had a lot of, a lot of partners in, in this process, technology partner and... and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, national agency supporting this security. I mean, it's been a very so. What I can say about this is that it maybe it was because of the pandemic, but the people um, usually are not so um, easy to bring up around the table and start developing so fast. You know, uh, all the stakeholders mm -hmm. are need a lot of time to to think to understand exactly what to do. Uh, I think there was something something special in this project because. Uh, I mean, the people, everybody was basically uh, trying to support, not just giving their, their um, support, um, with their skills and support, but also trying to not create so much um, overhead for, for discussion and mm -hmm. so on. So the, the solution wasn't perfect. We know there are still yeah. a lot of uh, issue in terms of technology improvements that could be done, but in very, we, we answered to a specific problem in a short time in, with a community of millions of people. This is something, yeah. first is the first time happening in Europe and, and, and a sort, such kind of uh, collaboration in terms of technology, uh, as I said, policymaker, scientists and all of them. Yeah, I think what we, what we all learned from this uh, COVID uh, project was the best thing for a project is to have a, a, a really, really huge urgency. Yeah. Because then thing, decisions are made uh, quickly, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure that that's at least one of the positive outcomes that we have learned that 
if there's an urgency and, and, uh, and, and you don't want to go for the perfect solution, uh, but you go forward quickly enough, you make quick decisions that you can, uh, in, on all different levels, do amazing things, basically. Huh? And this, yeah, and in this case was also uh, nice because uh, everybody was working to move out from the pandemic. You know, you know this tool was mm -hmm. the tool to move out from the pandemic, to get people vaccinated, to get back to travel uh, and so on. So there was also yeah. a sort of excitement on, on, on that. Yeah. So, Paolo, you, you get to, to work on super important and super interesting programs. I mean, developing the, uh, the, the, the green pass, pass for, for, for Italy and the, defining the national cloud strategy for, for Italy, just being a, a couple of examples. Um, tell us a little bit more about the, how IT is organized in, in, in Italy and how the, um, the National Department for Digital Transformation plays a, a role in there. If you take a step back how do you see, because that's a complex thing, in a huge country like Italy, organizing IT and digital on all different uh, administration levels and so on and so on. So, so how do you see that moving forward and how do you see the, uh, the, the digital transformation department playing a, a, a role in there? This is a very good question because <laughs> every, every, everybody is asking this now because every, when you are in this kind of process, basically, uh, there isn't always uh, an answer. I mean, you need to adapt over the time the role of such kind of uh, uh, structure in, uh, in the government. Today, uh, mm -hmm. the department uh, um, has two, two main functions. So it's not a normal department. Just to be clear, when I say I'm a CTO, I'm not sinking to any board. So what, what we did, uh, <clears throat> especially in the past years, um, was to bring at the table, but in this case, uh, the table is the council of minister, a minister on this on this topic. So this is the, the second time we have, uh, sorry, the third time if we count uh, in the, uh, more than t ten years ago, uh, that we have a minister for digital transformation, and innovation, um, and this is uh, something uh, very important because uh, the the politics all everybody is understanding that digital is not anymore. Uh, a cost, just a cost. It's not it's something that you need because uh, it's it's a tool, but it's some it's part of the core business of a government. Um, uh, and and so the department in this case, what is doing is uh, providing support in terms of stra strategic support to understand um, uh, where can be used uh, the technology and how it can be used the technology uh, and supporting the minister that is the people the, the person is sitting to uh, into the highest uh, government level we have uh, i think uh, uh, i think we can and i read um, a book from mark swartz it's, it's called a uh, seat at the table i don't know if you know that mm -hmm. that book basically describing how the cio got to sit in, in uh, the board right and, and this is in the business, uh, 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 in the industry, has happened already more than, more than 10 years ago. Uh, but in the government, it's still happening. So uh, the role of the department is just to keep this... Uh, <laughs> I mean, the whole department is like uh, the, uh, the core part of the technology that should go inside the, uh, the, the government, all the, all the different um, ministry, because you need digital everywhere. Digital is completely, uh, uh, I mean, it's, you can, it's, uh, I'd say, you cross digital in, a, in, any, in any area, you know? Uh, yeah. And this is, is, now is the role. Then there is a second role, it's more uh, operational, providing funds uh, and doing the active administration but this maybe uh, it's a little bit different. So it's more, um, uh, um, how to say, the day-to-day -day work. But the strategic one and advising the policymaker. Right? So how to bring yeah. the the, uh, the technology in the law? It's the other uh, the third one, I would say, uh, role yeah. of the department. Yeah, I, th I, th I think I completely agree. Huh? What, when you say that. Uh, uh, Every country needs a minister, minister for digital and innovation. If you don't have that, then who's going to take care and make sure that, that, that your country keeps up? Uh, and, and, and Italy needs to keep up and, and make sure that they, uh, 
fill the gap and, and catch up uh, with the rest of, uh, of, of the world and, and, and Europe. So I'm absolutely convinced that this uh, the Minister of Digital has been in many, many countries not uh, be put in, uh, in uh, have, has not been given the necessary attention and, uh, that it really needs. And the second thing that you say is that the role of the CIO within government organizations is becoming more and more crucial as well and that they need to have, uh, certainly need to have a seat at the table uh, because there's so much gains and efficiency and, and uh, to be won yeah. in making the government organizations more, uh, more digital. Eh? Yeah, in, in terms of also in the, uh, in the organization of the public administration, we define it also a role of the, a sort of CIO. So they, they, are, they now are understood, not just at the government level, but in any administration, we are trying to push to have someone able to understand this information, not just the CIO, but we are also talking about data steward. We are talking about uh, mm -hmm. people that understand the procurement process. And, and are able yep. to pro to create projects uh, because you need you need this kind of people inside in the public administration because as I said before, digital and, and the technology are going to be part of the core business of the administration. It's not anymore something you need. It's not a tool. It's not anymore a co just a cost. Yep. You have there uh, together with your colleagues a team of of, of three hundred people that work on digital transformation, set and standard support for supporting the rest of the. Administrations. Tell me a little bit this, this this team of 300 people. How is that organized? What kind of people do you bring together for this? And, and, and how do you set up such a department? So today, as I said before, we have two main mm, teams. One is the digital trans mm -hmm. the, uh, the transformation office, as is dedicated to uh, the national uh, resilience and recovery plan. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's basically done by account manager, people that are able to deal with the administration. Uh, they know obviously about technology, but at the same time they have, um, they need to uh, support the administration to, to, do, uh, to apply for, for, for the tender or to um, understand how to, to get money and so on. Uh, the, second, the second team is more technical, so we have um, uh, engineers, designers, um, people that work in the com uh, communication, uh, marketing, so we have all uh, the standard skills that, and, and, and people that usually you have in a technology company because we started like, mm -hmm. the motto was like a sort of startup in the government, right? So and, and this uh, this team basically is uh, is driving the uh, solution, is driving the strategy, is driving is working to mm -hmm. uh, change the culture, how to understand technology. Okay, uh, in, in the in the government, we are really working a lot with developers uh, to um, to create a community of developers into the public administration and and, and the market working with the market public administration. Uh, we are creating uh, a community of designers, how to design public services, how to design content for public service. There are specific rules, we are releasing a lot of rules. So the second team is, is focused on this and, and, and then we have specific team for spe special projects. I don't know, for example, the Green Pass. Mm -hmm. my, my role is to set up a team, uh, get all the, 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 the skill that I need to, uh, to drive uh, special project like that yeah, usually is uh, uh, time specific I mean it's, it's going to be short in time no, it's not something uh, mm -hmm. it's usually recurring task or uh, yeah. activity and how would you describe your role what is fundamentally as a CTO of, of, of this department what is fundamentally your role my role is to yeah to understand uh, uh, to drive the first contact with the administration to understand what they need, try to define the, um, what can be, uh, um, how can, could be addressed, but together with my team. So I did that. the second part of my role is to um, find the right people, bring the right people that could drive then the project, and, and, uh, and then advise directly the minister for uh, some some specific topic uh, address that. I mean, it's it's not like a CTO in an, in, in in a company. It's very different mm -hmm. different way on the, of doing this role. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a special type of organization. Right? Yes, it's, it's, it's perfect. Type. Try writing a job description for this is not, not an easy thing, I would say. So, so, so how, do you, how are you able to make sure that you attract the right people? Because you don't need hardcore developers. You need people that can develop uh, uh, standards and, yeah. and, and descriptions and support and roles and so on and so on. So, so how do you build a team, uh, that, that type of... Um, yeah. uh, team in, uh, in, in your organization? So, well, obviously there isn't a, a recipe for that, but um, there are ob different aspects of a um, job that are important for, for people. So we usually try to take all of them um, in consideration, but there are two, mm -hmm. um, two, uh, two specific aspects I, I, I think are important, at least for me. Uh, we spend a, a great part of our time working uh, uh, Working, so we don't want to know that the, our work is is, um, is just work, but it's more than more than labor. Okay, so um, everybody wants to be part of a, a community, part of something, and people build together, right? So usually, mm -hmm. we, I, I try to attract people and motivate people. Uh, looking for those people are not just looking for a job, but are looking for a mission, are looking for something that they want to contribute for their country. Uh, this is. I mean, this is the only way to, to, to get uh, really motivated. This is not a normal job. Mm -hmm. you, you deal with a, a huge amount of complexity and you need to be very motivated. Uh, and this motivation, we have been able to, to bring people. Usually, this is one of the reasons why they are here, because they want to give back to their country and they're very motivated for this reason. Uh, the, the normal people that are usually looking, are looking for a job it's not easy for everybody to be there. So to be, I have to be honest. So it's not easy to attract people mm -hmm. and 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 uh, and be there. But uh, this is one. Um, this is one of uh, the. Main. And the other, the other, the other component is uh, to create, um, try to create a, a very safe place. I would say, where mm -hmm. uh, you can just say what you think. You can just. Uh, bring your, your knowledge and share what you and can do. So a safe place when you're going to not be free. And this is very hard in the government because you are, you are observed by everybody, you know. Um, but this is something that's important because uh, people, if, if people don't feel safe, psycholo psychological safe, uh, usually will mm -hmm. not do the, the, this job. Yep. And, and, and where, where are most of your people based? They're all based in Rome or they're, they're spread out over the country? How is, how is the organization? Yeah, we are, we are basically based in, mainly based in Rome, but many of us work also, also in remote. So we do smart mm -hmm. working uh, from our own, also many, many cases. But yes, the main, the okay. main location is Rome uh, because everything is happening here. So, you know, uh, uh, so, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about leadership because you need to lead these teams of people and, and, and I mean, first of all, attract them, make sure that they, they have the, the necessary freedom to do uh, what, the, what they need to do. But how would you describe yourself as, as, as a leader? What is your leadership style? My leadership style, uh, I would say, is more on the serv servant leadership. So I really like to uh, support people. Uh, my team uh, usually ask what they are, what they need to get the things done. You know, I, I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm on their side, trying to support them on all that they need. Um, I tend to be more to get more assertive, try to control more when I see that it's something is not, we are not getting to to uh, the right focus or the right team. But usually I I'm. The, my approach is very um, soft, I would say. Uh, I like mm -hmm. to, to establish a bond with my team, um, why, with my tech lead, for example. I really like to talk with them about technology. I, I try to stay out every, to any, any kind of discussion because uh, as, as I have technical background, <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy to, uh, to get um, uh, intrigued by, by, by solving problems, you know? And this is not something that, that mm -hmm. a leader should, uh, should always should do. I mean, you have people able to do better that kind of job. You need just to support them if they have an issue, if they don't know how to fix something. 
uh, I'm there for them. Uh, this is yep. this is my kind of uh, issue. And how do you think you're perceived in by the people that you uh, that that work for you? If if I would go around and and uh, position myself at the coffee machine, and and drink a number of espressos and 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 talk to people uh, around you, how do you th what do you think they will say about you when you're not around? Well, I <laughs> I can really say so. My my impression, but this is an impression. Sometimes uh, I could seems to be a little bit insensi um, insensitive so I'd say I don't I would not go to sometime um, uh, I'm not so good to understand their their feelings and so sometimes mm -hmm. I'm I could f I think I think I don't know like I maybe I am perceived like a more um, straightforward so I, I usually say everything I, I, I think and I'm not going to be <laughs> I haven't any kind of filter you know so sometimes if you don't know me uh, I could seem a little bit uh, rough so <laughs> and and so my guess is that so uh, okay now that that also fits in a little bit in the in your personality profile you shared with us that you are your MBTI on my bricks uh, yeah. Personality type indicator is is you're an entrepreneur, an ESTP. Uh, so these are people that are uh, and they have extroverted, observant, thinking, and prospecting personality traits. And these ten people tend to be typically energetic, action oriented, and uh, they navigate whatever is in front of them. And uh, and they love uncovering life's opportunity, whether socializing with others or in more personal pursuits. Now people with your personality they typically have the following strengths and you let me know if if that if if it if it fits the bill if it fits uh, you as a person so ESTP's strengths are they can be very bold um, rational practical they can be very original uh, perceptive very direct and very uh, sociable does that does that fit the bill <laughs> that does fit perfectly the bill <laughs> exactly that fit perfectly the bill yes Yes, um, I'm, I'm very direct and uh, <laughs> that's perfectly fit and the description of you, how I usually uh, drive my team, I usually interact with people, uh, I really like, I usually, uh, well something, something um, maybe that does not fit is that I, I also really like to uh, plan a strategy so I'm usually um, like to to have a mission to have a plan and also to discover okay things but all the rest uh, it fit, it fit perfectly now well, every coin has two sides so, so there's your darker side as well so let's talk yeah. about your development areas and, uh, and 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 see what we can learn there so people with um, the ESTP MBTI profile they can be like we said sometimes insensitive sometimes impatient uh, they can be risk prone, they can sometimes be unstructured and they could sometimes miss the bigger picture. So which one of these, uh, you already said that sometimes maybe you perceive that as insensitive and so on. So how do you develop yourself in, 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 in that area? Uh, I think uh, at least the first two uh, are quite, uh, I mean, they fit very well. And usually I got in some, I mean, usually got impatient. And, and uh, sometimes, mm -hmm. as, as I said, I might be perceived them, and maybe I am, I don't know, uh, insensitive. Uh, I know this got too big issue <laughs> with my character, so what I usually try to do is to uh, maybe not, uh, I mean, in, in a sort of retrospective to try to fix that. Uh, it's mm -hmm. hard to, um, in direct, I mean, on, on uh, life to, to fix that kind of issues, but uh, I think you, you sometimes I try to uh, analyze what I did or what I didn't uh, in order to at least understand where, 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 where it was wrong. And they usually ask people to be very direct, but it, it's not easy for other people to be very direct because if you know what they are, the other people are thinking, it's easier to, to fix this kind of <laughs> issue. But, people not be having that way necessary so you need to to put attention on on, on details so what I, i'm trying to do is put that more attention on 
on on on what people uh, do and and because there are a lot of signals that maybe I can not I'm not receiving on what they're doing that could uh, lead me to understand their feelings or what they're thinking, and this is uh, uh, well the patience <laughs> to get <laughs> patient that's it, it's our, the, the art path to you know, to 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 fix when you want to see something uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> That's not easy, at least. I think that's the, 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 the art part to fix, at least for me. Okay. So, Paolo, tell me, do you, have, do you have a personal mantra that you use in your life? So, to be honest, I do not have a personal mantra or any special, but uh, if I had to choose one, I it would be uh, never do the same thing again. So, I, I don't like to repeat myself. And I, like any IT guy, I... I like to automate things, so <laughs> that that might be my my answer. Yeah. Do you have important people in your life, mentors, people that you look up to, or public figures that that you follow that you that inspire you? Well, uh, yes, I, I think I have many mentors. Many of my friends are my mentors. I I like to. Uh, I have three, four friends are um, my mentor but if I need to find a public figure I think um, I, I could say that Diego Piacentini has been my mentor uh, uh, the, and also if I need to think someone to inspire that inspire me uh, in, in, in in this industry and then it's Italian it's Adriano Olivetti and but obviously can, it's, it's not my mentor it could not be my mentor but also, also my um, my parents, uh, they have been mm -hmm. my mentor, at least at the beginning of my life. So, yeah. If you look back at your personal life, what is, what's the best thing that has ever happened to you? <laughs> well, many beautiful things have happened to me, but I think uh, the best, I, I, well, I, I, I like to thinking that the best things are yet to happen. So it's... Uh, uh, as <laughs> as uh, Natsin Ikmet said, uh, the most beautiful sea has been crossed yet. So I like to think it that way. Okay, the best is yet to come. That's uh, <laughs> to summarize that. Yeah. So Paolo, we have good things that happen to us. We also have bad things that happen to us, and and, yeah. and we learn from them. And and this is how we grow as as as, as persons. So. Would you care sharing maybe one of the worst things that have uh, ever happened to you and how, uh, what you learned from that? Yeah, I think uh, for me, uh, the, the worst thing happened when I was young, I was nine years old, my, my mother dead. So that was, I think, the worst thing happened in my life. And that was possible mm -hmm. to, that let me grow a lot, not immediately, but later. But, and then this was possible also, obviously, to my family. For my family, it's very important for, for me, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how would you say that has, has had an impact on your life? Did you become um, more independent earlier, more serious earlier than, than, than other children? Yes, I think independent, serious not. I, I really like to, to joke and so mm -hmm. not serious but um, independent. I think that I had an impact on my independency. I, I moved uh, away from my uh, my family has house very, very early in my life, so that's that's something mm -hmm. uh, had that kind of impact. Okay. Now, if you look at your professional life again, and 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 I mean, you've you've built great success with Green Pass and now with the uh, cloud strategy and, and many other things, I'm sure. Uh, but we all make our mistakes, right? Yeah. And 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 we all uh, and and if it's good, then we make brilliant mistakes that where we, we can learn from. So. What would you say in looking back at your career was your most brilliant failure and, and, and what did you learn from that? So professionally speaking, my most brilliant failure was the contact tracing app just before the green pass uh, that was in Muni. Mm -hmm. So we did the, one of the most perfect app, uh, contact tracing app, uh, also certified by the, the MIT. But we... Mm -hmm. Uh, make a huge mistake, not thinking at, at, at the app like uh, um, um, the whole system. And the, I mean, we just taught the app as a solution, not how the app could, uh, would be integrated, would have been integrated into a complex system like the uh, health system and, and uh, regions. So uh, that was a failure because it wasn't really used. 
uh, even it was uh, perfect, privacy preserving, done with open source, done with the best practices we had, um, with best technology we had, and so on. But then it was completely failure because, uh, well, it wasn't really used by people. And there are different reasons, but that's, I think, where I learned a lot in terms of how to uh, bring te technology into the society, how, how, how people use the technology, uh, and how they are uh, nudged to use the technology, because people need to understand why, why need to use that app, and so on. I think that it's uh, really my brilliant failure and most, one of the most interesting that where I learned really a lot of things. Okay. In your, in your life in general, what is it that you fear most and love most? Uh, so I fear most to get bored. So I need to, <laughs> I need to have projects and things to do. I need to uh, see people. Uh, so this is a really fear uh, to, to get bored. So, and, and for this mm -hmm. reason, the thing I love most is uh, being with people, uh, especially when mm -hmm. I need to connect with them, I need to uh, do some adventure or some things. I mean, I like to project and, and, and do find new, new things to do. Okay, and, wh and what do you do outside of work? What are your personal passions outside of work? Well, I like to sail. So I have a small boat and I usually go outside sailing when I have time and that's also mm -hmm. a nice uh, team building uh, activity and mm -hmm. and as I, every Italian I like to well I'm, I'm sommelier too so I like to drink <laughs> that's okay. saying it that way <laughs> sound <laughs> could sound a little bit strange but um, I really like to uh, yeah to discover new new things uh, and you're spoiled in your beautiful country with, with top yeah. wines, of course. Right? Yeah. I also travel a lot in, in, in the country to spoil that and mm -hmm. also outside the country. So France is another place where to go for wine. So, so Paolo, you're still very, very much in touch with technology, of course, as, as, as a CTO. What would you uh, select as, as is for you one of the most exciting technologies of the moment that, that you and your teams are working with? So, uh, if I need to say only one, I would say, obviously, uh, AI is uh, one of the most interesting things uh, we have, but we are far mm -hmm. away to get use of the AI in the, uh, in the public administration, because first of all, we need to get data, and we are, we are missing the data. Yep. AI is nothing without data, I mean, it does not exist. But, um, it, I'm, maybe I can say that was it really exciting, what it really excited me is not just the technology, because um, the technology itself doesn't say anything, but how we can we, how we manage to use that kind of technology. Uh, usually technology is not neutral. You, you cannot use technology. Uh, you, you need some principle, and, and uh, this principle usually have to drive you um, uh, how to use the technology, especially when you work in the government. Mm -hmm. And what it really excites mm -hmm. me, for example, is to have solution that could use uh, AI, for example, or any other technology to, um, for example, to offer a better uh, welfare uh, services. So, for, uh, for example, I, I, I would like to have um, a solution that uh, will give people that need some specific bonus or specific uh, uh, funds uh, for, I don't know, for disability or anything, without having them to apply to something. Just knowing that they have the right to get the money for the specific things. Uh, so how to transform a welfare state in something that is, is not by request by the people, but mm -hmm. they can, it, it, it's, it's, it's the government, it's the state that will reach you because you, the state know that you have uh, an issue, or you have, you want to um, to get uh, a specific bonus forms or something. So I mean, this kind of changing way of thinking that where it's where the technology and spe specifically AI can help us to get there. So Paolo, thank you so much for your time. I would uh, and 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 this brilliant interview. I would uh, love to uh, close this with our last question, and that is: I mean, these videos are being watched by. Um, future digital leaders as well, people that want to follow in 
to your footsteps. I want to be CTO in, 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 uh, and maybe a government organization in, in their country or in Italy. What, what's the advice that you would give to these future digital leaders? What is the, your experience that you can pass on to them? Uh, I, I think to answer this next question, I need to say one thing before. Uh, in Italy, we have a distortion of the labor market, meaning that people are considered young, professionally speaking, even when they are 40, 50 years old. And this is very, it's, it's, it's a problem. Many Italian working environment uh, have this uh, distorted effect. Uh, and uh, so my suggestion, my advice to the young leader would be to uh, take action, be bold, don't uh, stay behind. Uh, I think we need people um, to, uh, to, that, that are able to get action and, and to be brilliant and, and change, uh, introduce a turnover, generational turnover in our, our uh, uh, society. I think, I think this is the best advice I can, I can give them. They need to take action and they need to be to, uh, to grow together, uh, otherwise they will be uh, too older they, later to, to do what they have to do. So this is, I think it is everywhere, but especially in Italy we have this kind of issue. Okay. Grazie mille, thank you so much, Paolo. It was a pleasure. Looking forward to meeting you soon in, uh, in uh, beautiful Italy. Have a great day. And uh, I'm sure day. we'll um, enjoy some nice wines together in the near future. See you, thank you. Thank you very much.